show a wall of water, 30 feet high and 100 feet across, sweep homes, everything in its path, wiping hillside terraces smooth as though with a giant mop. Almost 300 million gallons of water in 77 minutes, an incredible disaster. Welcome to 1963 Los Angeles. It is a quiet December afternoon, around 3 p.m. Homes are covered in Christmas lights, and the day is calm. It's the holiday season, and many people are shopping for gifts. Suddenly, a wall of water comes crashing through the Baldwin Hills neighborhood in Los Angeles. Nearly 290 million gallons of water surge into homes and shops, causing absolute destruction and multiple fatalities. This is the story of the Baldwin Hills Dam disaster, a complete dam failure that many Angelinos have forgotten or simply never learned about. Today, I will visit the site of the dam that once stood in Baldwin Hills and the reservoir, which is now a huge city park. I will attempt to trace the path of the flood and see if I can find any remaining pieces of the dam or its destructive path. Welcome back to Waste Media. Subscribe and hit the bell to be notified every time we post. World War II has just ended, and Los Angeles is booming. The city is growing fast and stretching outward in all directions. With this growth comes the need for more reliable infrastructure, especially water. The Baldwin Hills Reservoir was meant to be a solution to this problem. Unlike most reservoirs, this one would be built on top of a densely populated hill. Construction was led by the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power and began in 1947 and was completed in 1951. The idea was simple. The reservoir was to be an emergency storage for water at high elevation, which would, in theory, allow for fast, gravity-fed distribution of the water in times of disaster, such as fires or earthquakes. But right below the surface, there was a huge problem. The reservoir was built atop a low hill in the Baldwin Vista neighborhood, on land that geologists had long considered geologically unstable. Beneath the surface lay a messy foundation of loose, sandy sediment and fractured bedrock. More importantly though, the site straddled a subsidiary fault line tied to the more dangerous Newport Inglewood Fault. The reservoir itself was constructed with three earthen dikes and one giant concrete dam wall, which reached 232 feet tall and stretched 650 feet across the northern edge of the reservoir. To combat the instability of the ground, engineers added a compacted soil lining and complex underdrain system designed to keep water from seeping into the weak foundation beneath. But from the start of the project, disagreements sprung up within the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. Some engineers expressed doubts about the location, while others raised concerns about the new techniques being used, especially the soil compaction method promoted by the project's lead engineer, Ralph Proctor. Proctor was no stranger to dam failures. He had previously worked as a junior engineer on the infamous St. Francis Dam near Santa Clarita, which collapsed in 1928, killing at least 423 people, but probably more than 600 because of the lack of documentation of people in the area. It was hard to get an accurate estimate. After that tragedy, he became a pioneer in earth-filled dam techniques including the compacted earth method used at the Baldwin Hills Reservoir. But even he acknowledged that this site would require special care. Despite concerns, construction continued, and soon the Baldwin Hills Reservoir was completed. This fence right here looks really old. This was probably part of the original infrastructure when this entire park was a reservoir. And the dam collapsed over on that side, which I'm about to walk to in a little bit. So this would have all been filled with water. In the late 1960s, there was a dam right about here. But there was a problem lurking in the shadows, a problem that had not seemed so serious to most engineers at the time. Just west of the reservoir, the Inglewood oil field had been pumping oil for decades. And as the oil was drawn from the earth, the ground began to sink very slowly, but steadily. Engineers were aware of this issue, 
but believed that a well-designed dam could tolerate such minor subsidence. This assumption would prove devastating. By the early 1960s, parts of the reservoir area had dropped nearly 12 feet due to subsidence, and cracks had begun to form. A catastrophe above Los Angeles had been quietly forming since 1951. It is December 14th, 1963. The skies are clear over Los Angeles. Families are going about their weekend routines, shopping and decorating for the holidays. At around 11.15 a.m., during a routine inspection of the reservoir, a caretaker noticed something strange. Water was leaking out from beneath the asphalt membrane liner. The asphalt membrane liner was like a water shield that lined the embankments and the base of the reservoir. Its purpose was to prevent water from seeping into the foundation soils beneath the reservoir. The east embankment of the reservoir is where the leak was initially noticed. Engineers on site immediately knew how dangerous this was. They engaged the emergency outlet system, designed to slowly drain the reservoir in case of failure. But there wasn't enough time. It would take nearly a full day to drain the 250 million gallons of water within the reservoir. They needed hours, but had only minutes. By noon, the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power requested evacuations for residents living downhill from the dam. Police and emergency crews moved quickly, and over 1,600 people were evacuated in just a few hours. At 3.38 p.m., disaster struck. A large section of the dam's northern wall collapsed. A thunderous roar erupted as a massive wave of water exploded from the breach, crashing down into the neighborhoods below. A wall of water up to 50 feet high in some places raced through the residential streets. Within minutes, Cloverdale Avenue was underwater, then La Brea, then La Cienega, Jefferson Boulevard, and on. Cars were flipped and homes were completely crushed. Pavement peeled back like pieces of paper. The water was unstoppable. Eyewitnesses described it like an earthquake or a bomb. Quote, it sounded like the sky had split open, one woman later recalled. Another caught in traffic on La Brea Avenue watched a solid wall of water come rushing toward her car. Quote, people just jumped out and ran. Some made it, others didn't, end quote. Five lives were lost in the flood. Though the death toll was not zero, it could have been a lot worse. It could have easily been around 1,500 had people not been evacuated just hours before the collapse. In total, there was around 16,000 residents in the flood area. In just 77 minutes, the entire reservoir was empty. part of the dam. This is where all the water started running through. All the way down this canyon. Straight down into the Baldwin Hills. Took out hundreds of homes. The investigation that followed was extensive. What caused the breach? The answer was both simple and complex. The asphalt liner had cracked. Water seeped into the embankment slowly eroding the soil. Over time, this erosion undermined the dam's integrity. But why did it crack? Evidence pointed to movement underground, seven inches of displacement along the fault during the dam's lifetime. Two of those inches had occurred in the months just before the disaster. And that movement traced back not just to the fault itself, but to decades of oil extraction in the nearby Inglewood oil field. Oil field operators had not only pumped oil out, they'd begun injecting water back into the ground to extract even more, creating pressure, fractures, and ground movement. As the water receded, the damage became clear. 277 homes destroyed. $12 million in property damages, and 500,000 people without water temporarily. Today, if you were to come to this park that now stands within where the reservoir once was, you would not know of the disaster that took place here. The park is peaceful. This site is now part of the Kenneth Hahn State Recreation Area, 
a sprawling urban park with tons of hiking trails, playgrounds, and amazing views of Los Angeles. Check out the Patreon. This month, I'm gonna drop the first full-length video on there. Uh, it's gonna be about the Black Dahlia murders. No holding back, nothing. I'm not afraid of getting shadow banned on there. So check that out. I'm gonna be posting there a lot more. I already started posting there, but some longer videos are gonna start dropping on there and exclusive photos from these trips. I'm thinking of starting a series on the Patreon that's gonna be more conspiracy theory heavy and kind of that side of history. So that's gonna be cool to check out. Be on the lookout for that on the Patreon. And if you guys like this video, make sure to subscribe and like the video. It helps a lot. The sound of rushing water has been replaced by the sound of birds and a nice breeze. But beneath the ground, the fault lines continue to move. Geologic monitoring in the area continues to show subtle but significant shifts in the ground. To the west, the Inglewood oil field still operates. In recent years, there have been reports of gas discharges and new fault activity in the nearby residential areas. In 2013, a plaque was placed to mark the 50th anniversary of the disaster. The story may have begun to fade away, but the evidence of this once massive disaster still lingers. You just need to look in the right places. Make sure to check out my other video on the St. Francis Dam disaster. Thank you and see you next time.